Okay. Uh, welcome back to the wonderful world of geology class, everybody. Um, new six weeks, even though that doesn't really matter for the Navarro classes. Uh, it is a new six weeks, and you'll get uh, report cards. When they send out report cards, like Wednesday? I don't know. You'll get report cards at some point in time this week, probably, uh, unless everything just crashes and all the internet programs go down, uh, which seems like it might be happening, judging by my emails. Uh, yeah, but we'll just keep on rolling and do the best that we can, because no matter what happens, Mr. Bailey still has his PowerPoints. Um, I'm sure y'all are thrilled by that. But uh, today we're going to talk about water, water on the Earth's surface, and landscapes fashioned by water. Um, they start off by explaining internal and external processes. Uh, the thing to remember is we're pretty much just talking about external processes today. Um, internal processes are powered by the energy from the Earth's interior, um, which is not what we're dealing with. Although, I guess technically by definition, uh, what would gravity be? Because it's powered by the Earth's interior and its mass but its effect really only takes place at the surface. Um, it's just internal, uh, yeah. It's both internal and it, they just cancel each other out. It's just internal. Uh, or is it eternal, which it is eternal. Uh, gravity is not ever going to go away. Um, but yeah, remember that gravity is a part of this, uh, especially with a lot of the processes that we're talking about. Um, maybe I'll look up and see where exactly gravity falls in these. Um, but external processes occur at the Earth's surface, um, powered by energy from the sun usually. Um, and so that's going to be your wind, um, your, your currents in the ocean. Um, when we talk about gravity, though, um, that's not necessarily powered by the, the energy from the sun. So just keep that in mind. Um, our three main external processes that we're going to be talking about, you're already familiar with weathering and erosion. We've talked about those uh, quite a bit. Um, mass wasting is going to be the new one. This is essentially just gravity pulling things down. Um, it, it doesn't really involve wind or water. Um, sometimes water can help by adding extra weight. Um, but in general, mass wasting is just gravity at work on a slope or a cliff. Um, and so it's a transfer of rock or soil downslope under the influence of gravity. So remember that when we talk about mass wasting. Um, the mass part is what's being affected by the gravity. Um, and wasting is just a general term for it kind of going downhill um, and ruining all our plans. Um, so here's an example of a rock slide on a, on a, like a cliff in a mountain range. Um, this was taken probably just after it started. Um, and then you can see that uh, the, the debris is kind of spread out and you got a lot of smoke and dust from, uh, not smoke, but dust from all the stuff settling and falling down the uh, mountain. Here's another one. Um, this is like those chalk cliffs that we saw in the other picture. Um, this whole section has kind of loosened and given way um, and created this big, big landslide. That's a lot of material that's kind of come out uh, off of the shore and into the water. Um, just a little small personal story. I went, uh, we went on our honeymoon to Washington State uh, and stayed in this like really nice bed and breakfast uh, right on a cliff, very similar to this. Uh, looking out over the Juan de Fuca Strait, you could like see Canada if it was clear. Um, but there's a whole street, like just down the street, there's a whole street of houses um, that had been condemned because of events like this. Um, you could tell they'd been there for a long time. They weren't new houses. Um, but slowly over the years, uh, the ocean waves had eroded the bottom of the cliff. They had had several different rock and landslides. Um, and at some point in time, the cliff face um, got too close to the house and, and was, uh, you know, of questionable stability. And the city came in and was like, you can't live here anymore. Um, this is, this, we're going to have to condemn the house. And so, uh, you know, living close to the cliff is nice for your views. Um, but know that most cliffs will not last forever. Um, also, another thing maybe we'll look up when I go to the video part. Um, Y'all are maybe a little young to remember this, but uh, a couple years back, uh, there was a house on White Rock Lake, like on a cliff on White Rock Lake. Um, and it was built too close to the cliff and they had like a fault line open up and like half the house fell into the lake. Um, and it was a big like hubbub because the house had fallen in and boaters were coming to like look at it and gawk at it in the same way we all like rubberneck to see wrecks on the highway. Um, but they didn't know what to do because they condemned it, but 
Um, you can't tear it down because you can't get like a bulldozer in there to bulldoze it and have people come and clear the debris away because the cliff's unstable. Um, and you can't just let it sit there and possibly fall into the lake because people in boats are coming around and it's hard to control people on the water and where they go. Um, and so literally the fire department had to come and like push a pallet of like gasoline soaked hay into the garage and like throw a Molotov cocktail in the garage um, and set the house on fire, um, which worked, but also resulted in like flaming pieces of the house falling down into the lake um, while like helicopters circled around it. Uh, it was just a really exciting day on the news that day. Um, if you're into like houses burning and without people inside, um, everyone was safe and no one got injured. Um, but yeah, it was just this big thing. Like, what are they going to do with it? And then they're like, the fire department's going to set it on fire. You're like, wow, you never see the fire department starting fires. Uh, it was, it was an interesting thing. So don't build your house too close to a, a cliff or maybe have a geologist come in and be like, Hey, is this stable? Is my, is my property value going to literally go down into the lake? Um, what's going to happen? So, um, here are your four different types of mass wasting. You can see at the top, we're talking about mass wasting here. Um, so these are all gravity driven. Um, so slumps, I wish they kind of moved these around a little bit. Slumps and earth flows are going to be pretty similar. Um, we actually see slumps and earth flows here in Texas quite a bit. Um, with slumps, I already have my pictures drawn. Um, this is not a volcano. This is an overpass for a bridge here in Texas. The, the perspective's off on the road, but this is the road. Um, and to build our bridges, uh, we could just build giant hills on both sides of the road. Uh, and the road goes up the hill, and then they put the bridge in between the two hills. Um, but these hills are usually just them piling dirt up. Like, they haven't been there for very long. We might throw some grass on the side, but as you know in Texas, if it's real hot, the grass dies. Um, and if we happen to get a lot of rain, gravity is going to pull down on these slopes. Um, you know, and if it comes down here, they just come and fill it back in with dirt. But if it's close enough to the road, um, they might have to re-put the, the guardrail in. Um, they might have to close down one lane of the, the bridge um, and make sure that it's nice and stable. Um, but you will see these on these overpasses. You will see little uh, earth flows like this. It's kind of a little bit in between an earth flow and a slump because it's not quite this steep. Um, and while you may have a little bit of curvature beneath the surface, there's just not a whole lot of material for this to happen. Um, but it's not quite as flat as what's going on with the earth flow. So it's kind of like a hybrid in between a slump and earth flow because it's a, an artificially created slope. Uh, it's not like a natural thing that's happened. It's something that we made. Um, but these are things that you can see around here. Um, an earth flow is going to be really slow. If you see like a, a fence that is, is leaning, like an old fence that you could tell used to be straight but is now not straight, um, that's an earth flow issue. Um, just the, the ground is slowly moving downhill. Um, not enough really where you can see it or you get big cracks, um, but it's just barely moving downhill. Uh, and that will make your fence posts or your uh, telephone posts lean, um, which is why in some areas, I don't know if y'all have them out here, but in, in, in city areas um, that have these issues, they will have you put your, your fence posts like really deep, uh, like Waxahachie code now is your fence post has to be like four feet deep in the ground. Um, and if you've ever had to dig a hole, four feet deep is deep. Um, that's a lot of digging. You will be like worn out just after one hole. Uh, so they, they do that to kind of keep the fences up straight so you don't have as many issues with uh, leaning fences and neighbors getting mad at each other or uh, homeowners associations being like, your fence looks like crap. Uh, and telephone poles too. Telephone poles are really expensive to replace when they start to lean, it's dangerous. Um, this is kind of a more steep slope and you get these curved surfaces that rupture underneath and you get sliding along that surface. Um, you don't really see that because it's beneath the surface, but what you see are these kind of stair step drop offs that you get, um, because of all the little curved surfaces underneath. And so this is more like a physics problem as to why these surfaces are curved. Um, but this happens very regularly. So these are the two ones that are kind of matched up together, uh, slump and earth flow. And then you have your de debris flow, which is essentially a mudslide. Um, doesn't have to be wet with mud. Um, it can be dry that's just kind of come off of a valley uh, near a mountain complex. So you have to have a pretty big hill, a pretty big slope for this to happen. Um, but this would be like a rock slide or a mudslide. 
Um, and then you have your actual rock slide, which as they're showing here, um, is mostly just rocks. Um, your top surface doesn't have a lot of dirt. Um, there's not really a whole lot of water involved. It's just big chunks of rocks that have come down the hill. Um, has everyone seen that one video of the car that almost gets like completely destroyed by the rock that's like five times bigger than it? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, we'll watch in a little bit. Like they have a dash cam and at the very beginning, like they didn't see it, but in hindsight, they went back and looked and you can see the rock fall off the like very top of this mountain. Um, and then like a full minute later, the car in front of them like literally almost gets killed by this huge rock. You can see it come down. It hits the front of their car and like starts to tilt over. And I think if it had tilted over, it probably would have killed everybody in the car. But then it like tilts back over and stops. Um, it's crazy. We'll see you in a little bit. Uh, but you have rock slides and debris flows. So just remember, these are all mass wasting. It's all really gravity driven. Um, gravity pulling down on things and it not really having enough cohesion to hold itself together uh, and make sure that it's not moving. Um, they talk about landform evolution, mass wasting, stream valleys. Um, this is all pretty general. I think I covered all of this already. Um, and you do have access to the slides. So if you want to go back and look through all this, uh, you can. But I'm not going to read all that. Um, one of the things they're showing here, this is obviously the Grand Canyon. Um, the Colorado River runs through the middle of the Grand Canyon. Uh, and what they're showing you with this, um, oh, the word just left the, my brain. Um, it's like a side cut. It's a profile view. Um, you see all your sedimentary layers up top. And then down at the bottom, it says it's metamorphic and igneous rocks. So you, as we know from the labs, your metamorphic and igneous rocks are going to be much, much harder than your sedimentary rocks that are made of sandstone, limestone, and shale. Shale's like a mud rock. Um, and so all of these are going to be pretty soft compared to your harder rocks at the bottom. So you can see that the river and gravity have kind of cut this really wide swath through your softer sedimentary rocks. But when you get down to the hard rocks at the bottom, it's kind of just a small little channel. Um, the sides are much steeper um, and you don't really have the same kind of erosion going on. But the point is, anytime you have erosion in these valleys, gravity is gonna pull it down and there's only one place it can go right down into the bottom. Um, and so when you have these events, a lot of material ends up being shoved down into the bottom, which I think, um, I'm just guessing here, but you can follow along and I think that I'm right. Um, if you look right here, you have this edge and then it comes around the corner, kind of following the shape of the river. Um, you have this little jut out right here. Oh no, I shouldn't have used that. Um, you have this little jut out right here. This was part of a rock site. Um, whatever material probably connected from right here to right here um, fell down this valley. You can see the valley right here. And then in the river, you can see the white waters, the rapids. Um, as this part of the rock, it probably fell from this side, slid down the valley and hit the other side of the, the other slope and got kind of lodged on this side. Um, and you can see the white waters caused by it because the river had to rise to come over that, uh, that hill of uh, material. Um, and if you've ever been like tubing or whitewater rafting, um, when your water has to go over something, it starts to go faster. Um, and the faster your water goes, the more stuff it can pick up and carry with it. Um, and so these get cleared out pretty quickly in the Colorado River because there's nowhere else for the water to go. Um, it's going to build up. It's going to get more pressure. It's going to go fast over the hill. Um, in another area that was more flat, if your river kind of gets clogged up, it's going to change route and it's going to go somewhere else um, and maybe flood a part of the, the, the area that isn't used to flooding, um, like a neighborhood or houses or some fields or something. Um, but in this, there's really nowhere else for the river to go. So it's going to end up clearing this stuff out pretty quickly. Uh, but yeah, when you go to geologic places like uh, national parks or, or river systems, uh, try to think about what's going on. Like you can enjoy the nature and think about what's actually happening in the nature. Um, so with mass facing, gravity is obviously the controlling force. Um, there are triggers that help along with this. Um, I'm going to say these out of order. In California, you get this a lot. Um, California does get earthquakes, and they do contribute sometimes, but they're more rare and probably less of a contributing factor. Um, but what's going on right now in California, 
and has been for months. The wildfires. Um, the wildfires come through and they burn all the vegetation. They burn all the grass and the trees. They kill everything that gets burnt. Um, so that's your removal of vegetation. Then in a couple months, um, in the fall, they're going to get lots of rain. It happens every year. Um, they get lots and lots of rain. Um, the hills that just got all their grass and, and trees and everything burnt away are going to get saturated with water. Um, and then it's mudslide season. And it happens every year in California. The mudslides come after the wildfires. It's just how they do things. Um, along with that, erosion is constantly cutting out the bottoms of your valleys and your cliffs by the ocean. Um, and so they just get steeper and steeper and steeper until something falls off. Um, and then they also talk about earthquakes here. So on the next page, they go into that a little bit more detail. Um, the only thing I'll say with saturation is there's two parts. Um, water weighs a lot. If you ever had to carry water anywhere, water's heavy. Um, more than just like a water bottle, but if you have to like carry a bucket of water, uh, it's not light. Or does anybody have the like Ozarka things at their house and you have to pick it up and like flip it over real quick before it spills water everywhere. Um, especially if, now they have the new ones with like the plugs that doesn't spill when you turn it over, but they had old ones where you just had to take the top off like a regular, yeah, real quick, like do the flip. And sometimes you'd miss and water would go everywhere. Uh, but water's heavy. Those things are pretty heavy to get up there and flip. Um, and so when water soaks into your soil, it helps weigh it down. The gravity pulls on it even more, which triggers a, a mud flow or a landslide or some mass wasting event. Um, and then water is also a lubricant, as we know from slip and slides. Um, you know, the water gets in between the different pieces of sand and rock. Um, it reduces that friction and that cohesion uh, and allows the particles to slide down the hill uh, much, much easier. Uh, over steepening, we'll talk about the angle of repose in a second. Um, you know, we do all sorts of stuff with human activity that steepens hills. Um, sometimes we make our own steep hills uh, to kind of squeeze them in between service roads and give ourselves some high bridges. Um, sometimes we clear out stuff to make houses. Um, there's a, uh, y'all don't go that way too often, but if you go on 287 towards Mansfield, they're putting a new like apartment complex and housing unit uh near this like little lake it's not even a lake but they call it a lake uh on the side of 287 and they built this like, super steep hill so the people that live on top of the hill have a great view um but like every time i'm driving by i'm like that hill is not going to stay there for even like a decade um the the rain is going to wash it away down into the lake um and eventually these people are going to have really bad uh foundation issues at the least if they're, the whole hill doesn't kind of give way, um, it's going to be an issue. And they put the hill up in like, you know, a couple weeks, just bringing in dirt load after dirt load after dirt load. It's going to be a problem. Um, but over steepening of hills is a big issue. Um, streams and waves from the ocean uh, undercutting cliffs and, and steep surfaces. Um, your, your erosion and your weathering is going to cut away the bottom the most. Uh, and so when the bottom gets cut away, it's just even more steep and you're more likely to have some sort of uh, fall or, or removal of land surface. Um, removal of vegetation, forest fires do this a lot for us. We also do it ourselves with deforestation, uh, land development, farming land development. Um, we don't have this too much around here because uh, it's mostly flat land. Um, but you know, in, in farm fields, if you don't have crops growing, um, you're more likely to have soil loss during big rainfall events because there's nothing to kind of slow that water down and hold it into your fields. Um, and then obviously earthquakes can cause all sorts of messes and dislodge stuff. Um, the angle of repose, this is more of a physics issue, um, but an angle of reposes are different for every different material. Depends on the grain size, the shapes of the grains, uh, the gravity involved, uh, the density of the material. But you can see with this sand hill, um, this is some sort of processing facility, and they probably had like a tube like this um, that was dropping all the sand directly on the top of this pile. Um, and the point of this is, if you have stuff built up, kind of dropping from the top, um, each grain on the side here is held up by the grain below. Um, and there's only a certain level that it will get up to before the grains start to slide down to the bottom. And so you can see from the little hill inside, this angle is the same angle as the bigger hill. Um, and so it doesn't matter how high you stack this, if it's all this same material of sand, 
this angle will be the same for a tiny little pile um, or a giant pile this size or one five times bigger than that. Um, it will always be this angle. And you can see this effect at the sand dunes. Um, don't do this all the time because if you go to a place that has sand dunes, usually they're very protective of them. And if they see you digging in the sand dunes, they'll get mad at you. Um, some places they'll even write you a ticket. So really don't do it. Um, but what's happened here, someone has come in down here and just dug out like a little hole in the sand dune. Um, and when you dig this little hole at the bottom, the sand right above it now has nothing holding it up. And so it's going to fall down into the hole. And now the sand above that has, and it's just this chain reaction that will go all the way up to the top of the sand dune. Um, it gets relieved a little bit. You can see that this hole is probably deeper than the outcut up here at the very top. Um, but you don't have to dig this entire thing. You just take one handful out and it will all kind of start this chain effect of, of cascading that goes down to the bottom. I mean, up to the top, my bad. Um, and so that is the angle of repose. Um, we consider this in geology, but it is more like a physics issue. Uh, I'm sure you could write some crazy math equation about it. Uh, here's a mudslide happening. And in fact, we're going to take a small uh, little video break and watch some mudslide videos. Um, so the first thing, let's watch this one in this Swiss town. These people are crazy. These are people that live a little too close to the mountain. And they're like, yeah, we're cool. We're good. Um, we'll just get our camera out and watch this bridge like explode with mud. Because uh, we'll be fine. Giant globs of sludge rush past houses and cars and take down nearby street signs. So like, look at this guy right next to this thing. And watch in a second. This van gets like swept away. I think it's that van. Yeah. By town, passersby saw it happen again on this bridge. And and you think you're good because you have this big water. channel. You're like, we deal with this all the time. And then, oh, I guess it's that van. That van's going to get taken out. This lady was standing right over here. And, like, where she was just standing is going to get covered up with this mudslide. Uh, don't be messing around trying to watch Mother Nature do crazy things. Uh, it will take you out. Yeah, this is a crazy mudslide. Um they're probably more prepared for it than any random town in the United States uh, because they, they've lived here for a very long time. The community is aware of these mudslides. These idiots. Um, it's a nice video, but you should not be standing on a bridge as a mudslide's coming towards you. Um, oh, no, they're still on the bridge. They're still standing on the bridge. And this is like a little like footpath bridge that can easily be taken out. Uh, look at all that material. It's a crazy amount of material coming down. Yeah, you all should not be standing there. Tragically, a group of onlookers got swept away by a giant mudslide. Uh, you always hear about people falling into places in the Grand Canyon because they weren't paying attention. They're like, oh, those ropes, those don't exist for me. I need to take a picture. So at first I was laughing at this guy because he's like, the flash floods right there, go. And I'm like, what is a little bit of water? And then you see it come and you're like, holy crap, he was right. Like, I don't know if that van's going to be able to turn around in time to like get out of there, but. It was a million miles an hour in slow motion. If that makes sense. Um, I I don't know the that there's anything else going on. Oh, yeah, there is. Hold on. Look at this car. We're talking about panic right now. The people in this car are like, oh, my God, let me get to the bottom of this hill and somehow get out of this. Well, this was somebody's driveway. There were three cars destroyed, buried inside. Okay, and then one more. We don't want to hear people talk. Is there an intro code that, like... Uh, <laughs> usually not. With that kind of stuff, it's it's extra insurance that you have to pay for. Um, and so people that live on the coast know that, like, you have to have flood insurance. But one of the issues with flood insurance is if you live in an area that's likely to flood, they're probably not going to give it to you or it's going to be really expensive. Um, and so, yeah. Uh, now, if the government declares it a disaster then you can get disaster relief funds. 
Um, but yeah, it's, it's usually not something that's covered by stuff like that. Now in a different country, uh, who knows, but, and then this one, oh, instead of going big screen, I hit the, maybe I'm going to recalibrate. Um, so this house is doomed. This is like the house, uh, on the edge of white rock lake, which maybe we'll watch a different day. Um, but the river's obviously flooding. It's eroding very quickly. This bank. Um, you can see that the, the majority of the foundation, this is a piece of their foundation, maybe their floor or two, um, has eroded out from underneath the house, and it's about to lose it and go down into the river. Um, and as we watch this, I want to point out, when you have creeks and streams around here during like a dry time, uh, the creeks can be rather clear. Like all the sediment has gone out, and, and you might be able to see little tadpoles and little things swimming around. Um, and the lakes too, the lakes are never clear, um, but they're not like a muddy brown all the time. When it rains and we have a lot of water moving through the creeks, um, it gets muddy. It picks up a lot of that soil and sediment. And you can see here very quickly, um, this river, which is moving a lot of water, has moved this house. Um, something that would probably normally not move very quickly um, or might even sink um, is now just being pushed down the river like it's nothing. Um, and if anybody's ever gone to like uh, uh, Wet n Wild, uh, it's, it's, what's it called? Hawaiian Falls. Do they have a? Hurricane Harbor. Yeah, Hurricane Harbor. Uh, Wet n Wild's what it used to be back when I was young and went there. Uh, and then they switched to Hurricane Harbor when I think Six Flags bought it. Um, or NRH2O, if that's still a thing. I don't know that it is. But yeah, Hawaiian Falls now is the small ones around. Uh, and they have, a, they have a Lazy River, right? Yeah, so the Lazy River. Um, if you've ever like, and at Hawaiian Falls is not a big deal because it's a small place, but, uh, Hurricane Harbor, like you miss your exit at the lazy river and it's like a big deal. Like, yeah, you see your like parents get out or your friends and they get up the steps and you like reach for the rail and miss it and you're gone. Like you got to get out of the next exit. There's no, like, I need to walk backwards 10 feet in the lazy river. Uh, people will get, you'll get hit by a tube or something. Um, but that is just like a small thing designed for like fun, fun time play. Um, a river will sweep, sweep you away very quickly. Um, the faster the water's moving, the bigger things it can pick up, even things like houses and cars. Uh, remember with your car, your car has literally has four floaties on it at each corner. Um, you wouldn't think that a tire would do much. Uh, tires float, especially when they have air in them. Um, so don't try to drive your car through uh, water and you don't know how deep it is because uh, you could get swept into a river very quickly and then have to be rescued and you'll be on the news and it will be embarrassing. Um, and if they find out you did it because you're being stupid, they'll charge you for it too because uh, rescues aren't cheap. So don't, don't get yourself in trouble. Uh, but just remember as we go through this, the faster the water is moving, um, the more stuff it can pick up and the bigger pieces it can pick up. Uh, I don't know what that is. Is that a couch or something? there's the rest of someone's house uh you know remember these are fun to watch because it's it's a house floating down the river but that's somebody's house uh they paid a bunch of money for that and likely it's not going to be covered by insurance unless it's like a huge uh disaster kind of thing so uh let's see back to the powerpoint so that's the mass wasting stuff um they go over the the hydrologic circle uh and the hydrosphere we've all seen this before um, we've talked about it a bunch in science class when y'all were younger. Um, remember that you have your cycle of evaporation where water gets uh, evaporated by sun in lakes and oceans. Um, it goes up into the atmosphere where it waits until the proper um, weather patterns, which again are caused by the sun, um, form precipitation and low pressure events that cause raining. Um, when it rains, it's either going to rain directly into the ocean or uh, lakes, which, which happens, especially in the oceans, a lot of rain just ends up right back in the oceans. Um, but if it rains on land, there's two options. It can become part of runoff in rivers and streams that eventually head back into lakes or into the ocean. Um, or it can infiltrate down and get soaked into the water or into the ground, um, where it either becomes part of the water table or it gets used by organisms, plants, uh, animals, uh, people. Uh, we drink a lot of water. We do. Um, so yeah, they go through the percentages here. 96.5% of the hydrosphere is in the global ocean. So the vast majority of water here um, is there for us, but not really available for drinking uh, and using like we want. 
1.76% uh, is in the ice sheets and glaciers, uh, and roughly 2% is lake streams, groundwater, and atmosphere. Um, remember that groundwater is available to us, but we have to do work to get it out, um, and there are some, some pitfalls with that. Um, and then the atmosphere is available. We just got to wait for it to, to actually rain uh, and make that happen for us. So um, they go through a lot of stuff here. I think the only thing that I want to talk about at this point is um, we will talk about this next semester when we get into climate change. Um, but melting all the glaciers would cause a sea level rise of dozens of meters. Um, I think something like at least 70% of the world's population lives within a couple miles of the ocean. Um, and if you're talking about dozens of meters of sea level rise, um, those areas are going to be flooded and covered up. Um, that would be a huge devastating thing for the world because we just have a lot less land to live on um, and a lot less land to grow uh, food for everybody to eat. Um, you can see little microcosms of that effect Every time there's a hurricane in the south, whether it's uh, Louisiana um, or Houston or wherever, um, people evacuate up here into this part of the country. Uh, and then a, a decent portion of them every time does not go back. Um, their house is destroyed. Um, they get a job here while they're waiting to, to go back. And they, they just kind of immigrate or emigrate, right? The E is immigration. Or if you're within the same state or country, yeah, yeah, yeah. Turn, uh, immigrate, which sounds weird and wrong, but I think it's right. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, and they don't, don't, they don't ever really move back. Um, Texas got a huge population boost after uh, Katrina, um, just because the devastation was so bad and it took them so long to rebuild. Um, there's thousands and thousands of people that, that just never ended up going back to Louisiana. And you go back. And you know it's only going to be a matter of a couple of years before you get another hurricane. And maybe your house survives that, but there's no guarantees. Uh, you could have to do it all over again. And so, uh, you know, we don't really have that too much here with tornadoes. Texas gets a lot of tornadoes, but any general one place in Texas doesn't get hit by tornadoes like over and over and over again uh, the way that coastal areas get hit by hurricanes. Um, so back onto the PowerPoint. Uh, precipitation that forms runoff. So now we're talking about rain that hits the land um, and, and doesn't go directly back into the oceans or streams. Um, it depends on several things. And they have this little, I guess, is this an acronym? Is that what those are called? Uh, a little acronym for all the words they have here, uh, which probably won't help you remember this at all. Um, but intensity and duration, so how hard it rains and how long it rains. Um, you can see here, um, sometimes we get really hard rains because we have thunderstorms that roll through in one like storm front. Um, but it doesn't rain for very long, so we don't really get flooding that often. Um, and then you can have the opposite, like with hurricanes. Usually with hurricanes, you get really heavy rain, um, but not always. And sometimes it's just that it rains for days because you're on the edge of that hurricane and you just keep getting rain for, for a very long time. Um, and that can help cause your flooding. So it's kind of both of these. Um, intensity and duration can affect how much precipitation runoff you get. Um, the amount of water that's already in the soil, and this can kind of go both ways. Obviously, if your soil is already um, inundated with water and it's already wet and muddy, um, it's, not gonna, it's not gonna soak up very much more. So most of the rainfall that falls is gonna end up in the creeks and streams uh, and end up flooding downriver. Um, but, and I kind of drew this a little bit, it doesn't help very much, but um, in Texas, one of the things we've noticed here and in dry areas is just because the soil's dry doesn't mean it's going to soak everything up. Um, and so you can have dry soil underneath, but if it rains really hard real fast, um, you build up a mud layer and the mud layer will keep things from soaking through. Um, if you've ever tried to water a plant at your house that, that has been dried out, um, and you just like stick the water hose over the top of it and let the whole hose kind of go on, um, the pot will start to fill up with water um, and it'll actually overflow because that top layer instantly turns to mud um, and water doesn't flow through mud as easily as it does like dry soil. Um, and so if you get really hard rainfall, all of a sudden um, you might build up that mud layer and then all the water that falls on top of it doesn't soak in, it ends up going down into your creeks and streams. Um, also, one of the things they talk about is uh, the extent and type of vegetation. 
Um, if you don't have any vegetation, that's not going to help with, with flooding. Um, that's going to help, well, it's going to help your flooding be worse. If you have vegetation, not only does it slow down the water as it moves through, um, the roots provide penetrating power and kind of give your water uh, conduits to actually get deeper. Um, and then obviously the plants soak up water themselves. Um, although that doesn't happen super quickly, uh, it does happen. Uh, the slope of the land is important. If you have flat land, it's more likely to flood, uh, like the areas on either side of the Mississippi, um, versus like a steep slope is, is probably all the water is going to go down the end. And then the nature of the surface material, is it like loose sand or dirt that soaks up water very well? Um, or is it concrete in a parking lot um, that's not going to soak up any water at all, not even like a single drop of it? It's all going to go down into the uh, creeks or, or sewer drains or whatever uh, the runoff is supposed to be at. So you can remember the acronym if you want. Um, intensity, duration, amount of water, surface material, slope, vegetation, I-D-A-S-S-V. I don't know. It seems pointless. I mean, your acronym's got to mean something like, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. You've got to have a thing for it. Um, maybe there is a thing for that, but I don't remember it. Um, so maybe it's not a good one. Uh, this. This will be a lab that we do, um, almost exactly like this. Uh, in fact, we will, we will probably start on that this week. Um, this is essentially what a environmental geologist does. Um, the whole point of environmental geology, not the whole point, um, but a large part of it is understanding where your water is going to go and if you have pollutants, where your pollutants are going to go. Um, obviously, this is like a, a hillside area, but it applies for pretty much anywhere. Um, when you have water that, that falls from the sky and lands as precipitation, um, it's only going to go downhill once it hits the ground. Um, and so the top of your hills are considered dividing lines. Um, it falls to the right of that line, it's gonna go down to the right. If it falls to the left of that line, it's gonna go down to the left. And so you can see here, they've drawn these dotted lines along this ridge, um, which is essentially like a sloped hill. Um, so everything that falls to the right is gonna come down here to this creek system and, and river. Everything that falls to the left is gonna come down here into this creek system and river. Um, same thing on the other side. This is your dotted line on the hill. Um, this is your drainage divide. Um, everything to the right goes in here. Everything to the left goes in here. And why this is important is because you can map an entire area. So they have this entire dotted line system. Comes all the way up to the ridge of the mountain and all the way down both of these ridges of the divides. Um, and basically anything that falls inside of this colored area is going to end up in these tiny creeks and streams, which is going to end up in this river which is gonna come out and flow into this ocean or lake right here at this point. Um, and so this is very important to note. Um, a, if this were like an industrial area or somewhat developed, um, if I had a spill over here, I know that it would go into this stream and end up coming out here and I would be able to plan ahead and try to do something about it. If the spill was literally just a couple meters over on the other side of the hill, um, it would be a completely different area with different uh, obstacles and things that I have to think about. Um, same thing with development. If I wanted to build a nice housing development here, um, you don't want to build it straddling this creek or stream. This could even be seasonal. Like most of the year, maybe it doesn't have water in it. Um, depends on how much rain the slope gets. But you don't want to build it here because if it floods, you're, all your houses are going to be in jeopardy. You build it right here next to the ridge, and you're almost never going to get a whole bunch of rain that comes down here. Um, and so you can plan ahead as to what's going to happen uh, with your, your mass wasting, uh, your water movement, and try to try to be a little bit better about that, hopefully. And not build your house on the edge of uh, White Rock Lake. Are we about to go? Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, this is where we'll pick, off, pick up uh, tomorrow. Uh, we didn't get quite as far as the next class. We'll talk about sedimentation. And then the different river types. Uh, and this is where we left off with the other types. We're only a couple slides away. Uh, laminar flow and turbulent flow. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, so, uh, yeah. Don't save that. Maybe I should have saved it. Uh, thank you for joining in, people at home. There's only uh, two of y'all left. There really only... No, there's actually... Three.
Because we had three for most of the semester, and then one student uh, went to online just a couple weeks ago. You're actually sitting in his seat. He's in your seat. Stay in your seat. I don't know. No one's watching these videos. The analytics on YouTube are like, uh, if your video has three views, and the average is like 15 seconds per view. Uh, so it doesn't matter. Have a nice day, though. If you do happen to watch to the very end, I'm proud of you.